uh, focused on climate action in the industry sectors in the Nordics. My name is Johan Lutzen and I work at IVL, Swedish Environmental uh, Research Institute, uh, who, uh, who are organizing the we webinar on behalf of um, the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency and the Nordic Council of Ministers. I have also a colleague with me here today, Sita Desiree Seinab and, and uh, Klintul Annika, who will uh, help out in the group discussions later. Uh, yeah, so um, there are lots of things to, to worry about in the world today, but uh, the things we're going to talk about here today, I think, are reasons to reasons for optimism. So I I look forward to to all the talks. I will just briefly we have, we have a lot of ground to cover, so I will just briefly walk you through the agenda, and then I will leave the word to the first speaker. Uh, yeah. So this is the basic two parts. One, the first part focused on uh, Nordic roadmaps, second on market cre creating measures, and we'll end the webinar with a ro roundtable discussion. Um, and uh, in the first uh, uh, session, um, we will hear from Lars Petter Maltby, uh, who leads uh, Process 21 in Norway. After him, uh, we'll hear from Jarmo Murma at the Ministry of the Environment in Finland, followed by uh, Torsten Hastort uh, uh, from Consito in Denmark. Uh, and then uh, uh, we leave the word to Tora Torgeis Dotter uh, at the Icelandic Housing and Construction Authorities. And uh, the first session uh, will end with a talk from um, uh, Karin Thurman from the Swedish Forest uh, Industries. And after that, we'll have 10 minutes break. Uh, so I think um, uh, I will leave it at that and may maybe present the, the second uh, round of speakers after, after the first break. Uh, I will also say that um, uh, it's my birthday today, actually. So this is a really good, uh, good uh, birthday gift, I think, to spend the uh, day with all of you. But uh, yeah, thank you for joining us today. And uh, I leave the word to, uh, I stop sharing and leave the word to Lars Petter. Well, thank you very much and congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I will start uh, uploading my presentation. So I assume you will uh, scream out if you do not see it um, like this. Okay, so um, Process 21 is uh, an industrial strategy for the Norwegian process industry. And uh, we work under a mandate from the Ministry of Trade and Industry in uh, Norway. Just a short uh, background on uh, the process industry in Norway. It is uh, localized all over Norway. It contains uh, industries of uh, chemistry, of uh, ferrous metals, uh, aluminum, pulp and paper and so on and uh, it is uh, of course an export oriented business norway as you all know norway has uh, significant oil and gas exports and it's important for norway also to to um, to diversify its export so today this actually this cake in the middle is from 2019 so you can ex imagine how it looks today it is a significant more of the oil and gas uh, compared to the others but it's also increasing in the process industry so it's about 11 percent of physical exports the process industry is also a very competitive industry uh, that's why also we can see that the value creation per head is uh, more significant than the rest of the than the, the norwegian activity uh, just also a short uh, page showing that the green transition also needs uh, access to raw materials. Uh, I think most people know that already, but uh, it's not only renewable energy, but it's actually also 
materials that are needed in order to, to facilitate the transitions, whether that is for wind energy, for solar cells, for batteries and so on. And uh, so there is a significant growth also expected in production of metals. And uh, Norway is a big producer of some of these uh, metals that are expected to have a very high share of, um, of growth. And if you, on this next slide, it's actually showing again in physical products, what are the major exports from the land-based industry uh, of, uh, of uh, the different type of metals. So you can see the first highest bar is refinery. So it's actually a refined oil uh, that is produced in Norway. So it's uh, definitely not a big part of the future, except for petrochemicals. The second uh, largest is aluminum. And then you can see also a big share, which is a combined nickel, cobalt, and copper. It's actually one company in and the, the largest refinery for nickel in, in Europe. Uh, followed by fertilizers, silicon, pulp and paper, zinc, and manganese alloys. So many of these uh, products are as the same as you saw on the previous list, uh, which has a significant growth and is expected to be used as a part of the green transition. Uh, this next one is a little bit uh, busy, but uh, it's to show a little bit that uh, the Norwegian industry or the emissions of the Norwegian industry is quite different from the rest of Europe. On the far left-hand side, you can see the in percentage, the share of emissions of uh, the EU versus Norway. And uh, the big difference here is uh, it's actually uh, the part that Norway has oil and gas emissions due to the offshore activity. That is the gray bar on 28% of the Norwegian emissions are linked to that. But the interesting part in this uh, session is the uh, blue one, which is showing the industrial emissions. And you can see the uh, from industry, 14% of the EU emissions is from industry, whereas in Norway, it's uh, 17%. And that's uh, more or less the same. These 14 and 17 is shown again on a 100% bar on the middle, middle illustration. And you can see the big difference is that the Norway has a significant emissions in the so-called non-ferrous area that is primarily uh, aluminum, it is the production of silicon and manganese alloys. So the mix of emissions in Norway are quite different from the rest of Europe. And these emissions are more or less all based on, uh, are a part of the uh, ETS uh, emission trading system. And uh, it is also, uh, uh, see, well, represents about 25% of the Norwegian total emissions. So it's a very important area. That's why we were given a mandate from the Ministry of Trade and Industry. Uh, the short version of this is to come up with recommendations, how we can ensure that this industry is, has a sustainable growth. We're at the same time as we minimize the, the emissions by 2050. So that is the task that we have been trying to answer. And the way to do this is that there was a steering committee formed contained of uh, existing of 10 people. I will not go through all of that uh, right now, but one of the first decisions that this uh, steering committee uh, was, um, identified what, what are the most important areas as for us in order to answer to these two challenges. And uh, uh, then we decided to, to um, actually establish 10 expert groups. I will not go through all the areas, but uh, it's everything from the, the growth side on product development, entrepreneurship, to the, uh, to the uh, technologies that are able to reduce our emissions from circular economy to carbon capture to to, to uh, modifying the processes to make carbon neutral processes. Uh, the, the reason why I'm also showing this that all these experts groups were headed by people from industry. So we made subgroups of six to up to 20 people actually, uh, of experts collected them together, headed by industry uh, representatives to give their own expert group uh, reports. And that is showing on the next slide, so these uh, expert uh, group reports is uh, shown to the on the left hand side, 
uh, in addition to that, we also had separate thematic reports and uh, we made sort of our own roadmap to show how we are able to reduce the emissions. That's, I'm going to show that at the very end of this presentation. The total effort that we uh, put into this was from private industry, about 20,000 hours. Uh, and, uh, and then from, uh, from uh, public uh, officials, more like 7,500. So it's really an industry-driven strategy with recommendations that we gave back to the, um, to the Norwegian government. So, and with 10, or actually all in all, 15 reports, uh, we had more than 130 recommendations. So I will not go through all of them right now. So I'm just giving you sort of the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and the first one was really on sort of the policy. It's important for Norway to be continue our partnership through the EEA agreement. Also to, to, uh, to be sure that we are in line with uh, and working together, co collaborating with um, with uh, the rest of EU as our main par export partner. Uh, what we also saw was that our recommendations, you know, we, we were given the, the, um, the uh, mandate from the Ministry of Trade and Industry. And if you look what our recommendations are, they are spread all over the different uh, areas. So it's important for us to, to, uh, to talk together with the, uh, the government of Norway on a broader, uh, broader uh, platform. So actually what has happened after we delivered, and it's not as a result of only our report, of course, but uh, the, the policy platform that the new government of Norway has uh, established is actually bringing in quite a lot of those recommendations that we were given. Uh, recently, just before the summer, the, the same, the Ministry of Trade and Industry is coordinating land-based uh, strategy uh, to, to uh, ensure more investments in the industry in land-based industry in Norway. That's through a, a green uh, industrial initiative. And as a subgroup of that, the process industry is identified. And I'm just showing also an example of a more specific strategy, which is for batteries in Norway. So we feel that what we have recommended is really already on the way on being operational, operationalized to a larger extent. In order to uh, ensure, so the two, two uh, areas that we were going to uh, give recommendations was for, for sustainable growth. And we have set an ambition that we are able to ex double our exports. That's going to be through working continuously with uh, reducing the carbon intensity of our products. Uh, it's also to specialize and grow value chains, be a part of uh, closer to the market and also initiate this battery strategy that I showed earlier. It's one example where Norwegian process industry, of course, has a lot of its market as a battery contains many of the products that we are exporting. And also to take new positions upstream and downstream in the value chain and at the same time, it's not, uh, we cannot do everything alone. We have to also facilitate foreign investments in Norway. And batteries, as I mentioned, is a big, uh, significant potential uh, of this uh, growth. On the climate side, this is a split uh, illustration. So what has been done is uh, on the left-hand side, the reduction of emissions in Norway from the process industry. So actually we have reduced our emissions by 41%. The activity is actually more or less stable. The, the value creation is higher. And as a part of our recommendations, we show this roadmap of how we are able to, to reduce the emissions further. So it's actually through a variety of technologies uh, to be sort of like for like to see the continuous reduction is through the red line that you see here. Uh, and but we also have uh, recommendations for uh, other type of technologies that is not a part of the, the process industry today. So if we look a little bit more in detail of this road that roadmap that we presented, uh, there are some reductions that can be done by 2030, but it's actually quite limited. Uh, it's by use of a few carbon capture projects. So, and you will see Per Brevik uh, later today on the, on the Norsem or Heidenberg cement. 
It is through some electrification, use of hydrogen, and also the use to some extent of biocarbon. We see that that's sort of limited in the long term, but um, it will be uh, useful for, the, for, for, uh, for some elements. Uh, as for 2050, it's actually a um, bigger challenge, and that's why it's urgent to work with that now, because there needs to be a total conversion of some of the industry's uh, processes that we can make them carbon neutral. And this work needs or not only, it's sort of on, on, uh, on, on a lab scale today, but it needs to be demonstrated on a higher scale and, and industri industrialized as well. So if you look at the red line on this uh, graph, it's actually a, a some limitation on the reduction down to 2035. And then we expect that we're able to industrialize on these solutions. But it's actually, you know, today more than 50 factories and to make them all, all carbon neutral, that's going to take uh, sort of a significant time. So it's very important that we have the technologies more or less ready by 2035 in order to roll out this to have the full effect by 2050. But we do believe that it is possible to be climate neutral by 2050 uh, by, by putting more force onto this. And actually it has been now close to two years since we, the, we um, finalized the report and gave our recommendations. And we also already see some of the uh, important companies like uh, Norsk Hydro, uh, Elkem, and Edamet as uh, three important players, and also Yara for fertilizers. They are working on, on building up their new process technologies in order to be climate neutral for 2050. So I think I leave it at that, and I, uh, there is a few minutes for questions. Thank you very much, Lars Petter. No, I see no question in the chat right now. Oh, maybe I can uh, raise a question myself then. So, so what what are the biggest priorities in the, in the near term? Would you say uh, to get this uh, there, process going? Yeah, the, the near well to answer this uh, twofold. It is uh, in in the near term we have about say 1.8 to 2.5 million uh, million tons of uh, of uh, co2 that can be reduced by 2030 and that's important and then we will be in line so that um, the norwegian process industry has uh, process industry has between 50 and 55 percent reduction from 1990 we did a lot earlier but it's now sort of a, a threshold uh, but that is going to be through carbon capture, which we will present by uh, Per Breivik uh, later today. Uh, we believe that the uh, fertilizer industry uh, is going to convert some of its production from fossil-based uh, ammonia to, uh, to uh, green ammonia. And also, as I mentioned, biocarbon is a part of the solution, especially for the silicon production. Uh, and but we know that that's going to be a limiting factor long term. So they are working also on the on the long term. And as I mentioned, what is urgent now is also to put more energy or not physical, but more resources, I would say, into the transition of uh, of uh, climate neutral processes. And uh, so because carbon capture is not going to work for all of these. Uh, but uh, hydro has a, a, an alternative to the inert uh, electrodes that Alcoa is developing. Uh, and, um, and Elkem is also working on a common carbon neutral uh, silicon production. And that's some of the most important emissions that we have uh, uh, in Norway. So, so we do see we have an optimism, but there needs to be more focus because it takes so much time to not only develop the process, but to to bring it up to pilot scale and then gradually to the, to demonstrate it also. And we do feel in this area that we cannot only wait for other countries to develop this, especially for aluminum, since uh, Norway is uh, such an important country, that we have to do some of these developments uh, sort of uh, that's a part of the Norwegian process industry responsibility also. 
Uh, maybe one short final question and then we'll move on from Jukka. As Norway is a big natural gas exporter to Europe, how do you see CCS of the natural, natural gas used in Europe? Is it a responsibility or even an opportunity? Yeah, well, I, I would, uh, that's a sort of a partly a political question. So <laughs> I will be uh, careful to have uh, too much uh, effort on that. But it's quite clear that on in today's situation, whatever Norway can do to maximize its supply to, to, uh, to Europe of the gas is very important. And uh, but I, I think that it's uh, overall understood very clearly that the, the need for oil and gas long term is going to disappear, except for a small portion, which is probably going to be uh, in the petrochemical area. But uh, so I, I think that uh, it's, it's a very sort of uh, mixed uh, situation, because at the same time, we need to produce as much as possible short term. But at the long term, we also know that there is not going to be by far the same demand for these products. So it is, uh, and it's, again, it is uh, important for the Norwegian economy today. But that's why, you know, for instance, in process 21, that's one of many industrial areas, how we try to diversify our export portfolio in order not to be stuck with the, or the, the dependency on the oil and gas exports. Thank you very much, Lars Petter. Uh, so we move on uh, to Jarmo Murman uh, from the Ministry of the Environment in Finland. <clears throat> okay, I tried to share my presentation at first. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jelma Murman. I work at the Ministry of the Environment in, in Finland. I'm dealing with climate issues and other environmental issues. I, I, for example, I was guiding the Climate Change Act preparation as well as the, the midterm climate plan preparation here, here at the ministry. I'm also the Secretary General of the uh, Minister of Working Group on, on Climate and Energy. So I will be at the more upper level than, than Lar, Lars was. Not, Lar was not, I'm not going so in detail in my presentation. So let's start. Uh, I would like to raise um, the, the Climate Change Act, which, which is quite new. Actually, we had the former act, but the new one that entered into force uh, this year in July, it, it really sets the, the climate, national climate object, objectives in Finland. We have actually talked a, a lot about the climate neutrality, and I mean it's climate neutrality. Often in, in Finland we also talk, talk about uh, carbon neutrality, but in legislation how we actually describe it, it's, it's really climate neutrality, it, it includes all the not only CO2, but all the all the greenhouse gases. So we we do have the climate neutrality uh, target for 2035, and we have also uh, emission reduction targets for 2030, which is at least 60 percent for 2040, at least 80 percent, and and for 2050 uh, at least. 90% but aiming at the reduction of, of 95% compared, compared to 1990 levels. So the targets are there and we, although the, the legislation it's only implies on the authorities, uh, it also guides the whole society, also the sectors and the businesses and, and, and they could follow the, the path to uh, be active on, 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 on path to climate neutrality in Finland. So uh, the uh, Climate Change Act also lays down provisions on climate change policy planning and related uh, monitoring. We do have uh, 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 
midterm climate plan and then we do have a, as a new instrument we do have this land use sector uh, climate plan as well it was added to the to the act at, at this stage uh, one also we have to be ensuring that the all actions are uh, sustainable and and justice of, of climate measures have to be taken into account and especially uh, we have to take care of the indigenous Sami people and so that they could maintain and live, develop their own language and culture and for that for that uh, purposes we have also uh, or we will also establish a Sami climate council uh, the other, other legislation that I would uh, like to mention that are important here in Finland, we do have the coal plan for energy generation uh, from year 2019 already. Uh, Coal-fired coal power and heating generation will be banned uh, in 2029. But also we have public support to the, the businesses that would like to change to non-fossil fuel earlier, earlier than 2025. So we, this is one of the, I would say, really groundbreaking uh, legislation that we do have in, in Finland, and it's it's moving on. I mean, the energy sector is really moving towards non-fossil fuel very quickly at the moment. Uh, then we do have the distribution application of biofuels, transport fuels, and biofuel uh, and bio, bio oil as well. Uh, and the and we will raise the application of transport biofuels to 34 percent in in 2030. The legislation is is in preparation. Although the government decided that the, the obligation will be lowered a little bit in 2022 and 23, but at the same time was decided that, that the distribution of the obligation will be increased to 34% compared to already existing 30%. And the rate of distribution obligation of biofuel oil to 30% by, by 2030, and light fuel is of course used in, in heating, machinery, and stationary engines. And now, at the moment, we do have uh, the, the goal is for, for 10%, so it, it will be a clear increase of, of obligation by 2030. Uh, then uh, the third one is, is the electric tax for industry mining data mining data centers and agriculture it will be reduced to use minimum from the beginning of the 2022 uh, and the extra tax reduction it would actually affect almost 10,000 industrial companies businesses and over 30,000 agro companies and at, at the same time the energy tax refund for energy incentive uh, industry will be phased out by 2020 25. So these are, I would say, the legal background for, for the in industry in, in Finland. Uh, the one, one new initiative that we have, we have at the moment, actually, there is a an, an, uh, uh, legislation that, that uh, has been, an act that has been already accepted by the government, and it's, it's at the moment at the, at the parliament, and it will be into force uh, in, the, in the beginning of the next year. And it, it's the, the uh, permit procedure and appeal procedure priority given to, uh, I would say, green economy, green transition investment projects. And the challenge, challenge that we have been is that the, the permit procedures are too long and that that's why the priority, and it's a temporary priority for 2023 to 2026, uh, are given to the 
important at its importance for grid transition. And it's it's actually for regional state administrative agencies that will have to take care of this priority when when uh, dealing with the permit permits. And the other one is the priority given to certain projects uh, uh, to renewable energy, low carbon hydrogen production, electrification of industry, carbon capture and utilization, and battery industry that follows the prim principle of no significant harm. So it's really restricted this, this uh, uh, priority given in, in legislation to those areas only. And there are certain criteria that, that will be also prepared for the permit uh, state administrative agencies to help them to, to, to look at the, the permits and the, the applications. Uh, the, the other challenge we do have is the long appear procedures on local detailed plans and master plans. And it's, it's relevant to energy production, especially wind power construction. And, and the, in 2030, uh, 23 to 28, bills related to investments in, in green transition would be considered as urgent by administrative courts. Uh, at the same time, more personal resources will be allocated to speed up and support the processing of permits and, and also the, to the appeal processes. And at the same time, the optimization of environment per permits and inspection procedures are ongoing. Okay, then we have this sustainable and innovative public program. We have actually a competence center that was established 2018 called Kano. It offers free guidance and information on strategic management and pub of public uh, procuring and, and developing public procurement competence and cooperation and networking in public procurement. So I won't go in details to that, just to want to remind you of that. Okay, then we'll go to the sector road carbon roadmaps. Um, it was actually the the government's in the government's program. There was an, an it was said that we we should prepare local carbon roadmaps uh, together with with the with the industry. And the roadmap. The roadmap's purpose, to our mind, was, was to provide a more accurate picture on the scale, cost, and conditions of the measures needed to, to move to a carbon neutral Finland by, by 2035. And, and uh, a total of 14 sectors have been prepared the, the roadmaps, and the coordination has been done by the, the uh, Minister of, of Economy and the Employment, together with other ministries. Uh, the sectors that has already done it uh, are chemical, sec chemi chemical sector, um, forestry, energy, uh, and some others. I tried to uh, remember what are the other ones, I can't recall them all, but I have to look at the list if I remember to remind you of, of those sectors. Uh, they are uh, energy sector, chemical industry, forest industry, technology industry, food industry, trade, transport and logistics, agriculture, tourism and restaurants conduct construction industry, property owners and developers, sawmill industry, textile and bioenergy. So I would say they cover most of the Finnish industri industrial sectors. And, and the roadmaps are actually quite, uh, uh, it was coordinated by the, by the ministries, but it was really done by the sectors themselves and also financed by the sectors themselves. The coordination meant that uh, there is some some sort of common elements in those roadmaps, and so that 
and they are also linked. I mean, the sectors are really linked to together, for example, on, on energy sources and so forth. Uh, and, and that's that's something that we had to take into care so that the energy that is produced won't be used by sectors, uh, I would say, many times that is available, I mean, the energy that is available, so that there needed to be coordination between sectors. Uh, the roadmap shows that the, the, I would say that the uh, electrification is very important, and and uh, the they showed that the, the increase of uh, industrial energy use would would increase about a hundred percent, hundred percent, and in, in total in Finland fifty percent by two thousand and fifty, if I remember it right. Uh, Clean energy is also Im important. I mean, and that that means really that the the uh, investments, uh, resources for the uh, investments have to be uh, on place, and that's something that the the public administration has quite important role. Uh, so the carbon handprint was also uh, took up by some of the sector sectors, uh, so, so to say the positive climate impact and, and of the current and upcoming products. And, of a, and, and it was recognized that the, the roadmap, roadmaps and, and the transition towards green economy, uh, it would offer great opportunities, opportunities for experts and for exports and, and new business business ventures. Uh, at the moment, the the first round of roads roadmaps has been done, and and the, but the work continues on implementation, and the implementation will be at the of course at the at the business and firm level. It's, it's really important to see that it's it's the the role and opportunity to implement and after a few years, I would say in two, three years, uh, the, up, the, up, the, the sectors will update the, the roadmaps and we will actually could be monitor then what have, have been done and perhaps we could get uh, more information of, of the investments needed to actually uh, 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 to achieve the, the, the uh, aims and, and targets that the sectors have uh, set up to themselves as well as the, the national uh, targets that are, are set up at the Climate Change Act. Also, what, what was uh, pointed out in this roadmap was the really important public-private partnership and this was to avoid, for example, economic risks that relies and and share the risk with 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 the society and and public sector and as uh, last slide i would like to raise the the funding what what we do have at the moment for 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 the transition towards the uh, green economy uh, we have of course the recover and resilience funding that comes from the european union and it it has decided by the government at that half of the funding goes to the green transition, green then transition, and that's that's about one billion euros, and that's for for the next five years. Then it has been agreed by the government on on 700 million euros additional funding on clean solution because of the energy crisis caused by the Russian armed attack. Ukraine. And also uh, the government has set up a climate fund in, in 2020 and it would focus also on com compacting climate change, promoting digitalization and, and boosting low carbon operations in manufacturing industries. So it, it's also an in, in important instrument for, for the, for the, for the uh, industry. Uh, but public funds alone will not be enough to make the urgently needed transition to climate neutral society. 
Uh, but fortunate, fortunate, fortunately, Finnish businesses and intra, industry is large. She sees the investing in climate-friendly energy, in a climate-friendly energy efficient circular solutions beneficial for the activities. So the funding, I would say it's there. It's not necessary enough and not always the instrument are available um, or suitable for, for the for the industry, but I would say that the next uh, five years, there is quite a lot of funding in Finland for, for green transi transition and hopefully it will manage and the, our industry will, will use the funding wisely. Thank you. That was all that I had to present today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jarmo. Uh... I think we were a bit behind schedule, so so maybe you can raise your questions to Jarmo in the chat, and you you can uh, try to answer them there, Jarmo. And, yeah, and that's okay. That's okay. Um, th thank you for a great overview. So I I um, did the word to Torsten Hastoth from Consito in da Denmark. Thank you. Uh, just share my screen here. Yes, does, can you see my screen? Uh, no. No? <laughs> and why is that classic? Yep. No, something is happening. Yep. No, something is happening. Perfect. Good. Yeah. Um, I think I will. I have ten minutes, so uh, and maybe half the time I will actually spend on this initial slide. Um, first, a bit about background about myself. I'm an economist. I currently work at Consito. We are an independent climate think tank here in Denmark. Uh, but I've previously worked at what was called the Danish Energy Association. Danish Energy Association is today called Green Power Denmark. In charge or. It's an organization that represents power producers and power distributors. Uh, but this is actually, yeah, I, I'm just going to talk about the climate partnerships in Denmark and they were established in 2019. So that's already some years ago, but this is actually a story about soft power more than hard regulation uh, because this all takes, well, Maybe this all takes its uh, beginning with uh, Greta Thunberg. It certainly takes its beginning with uh, the elections that we had in Denmark in 2019, in which climate was, and today we're actually in the middle of a new election, but the election back in 2019 in Denmark is known as a climate election. Uh, climate was the dominant theme of that election. And during the election process, the various parties in Denmark, and certainly the parties that came to power, agreed that we needed a goal for 2030. Uh, and that goal ended up being 70% uh, reduction with relation to, to 1990. So, uh, and at the time it was seen as extremely ambitious, uh, maybe even unachievable, uh, but it's, the parties agreed to it without actually knowing whether it was even possible or advisable to reach for a 70% reduction. But from that point onwards, the 70% goal, uh, reduction goal has just become, it's become law, uh, but not just law in the actual sense of the political parties agreeing on making it a law, but it's also, it's a defining cornerstone of Danish climate policy. Uh, and it certainly a strong argument against uh, criticisms of general goal-driven policies, uh, because often you will hear the argument that what's important is changing the fundamentals or creating the framework for industries uh, to invest. But here is certainly an example of setting an ambitious target, an ambitious target that lies beyond what is known or achievable and which subsequently with the necessary political power or wish, desire, actually drives a lot of, um, a lot of change. Uh, but what happened after, shortly after the 70% was that the current government 
set down these climate partnerships, uh, 13 climate partnerships, which later turned into 14 as airline industries were introduced. And each of these climate partnerships represented a sector or yeah, a broad sector in Denmark. So finance sector, heavy industry, light industry, transport sector, the part where in which I was an integral part of the report that I have here in my slide set was made by, uh, or at least led by the Danish uh, Energy Association. So, and to us, that was a slightly different process, but I'll, re I'll return to that in relation to those. But actually this was an example of, as I said, of soft power in action, because what, we, what these climate partnerships established was, um, it created a drive or it created a focus among all the different sectors as to how they could uh, contribute towards this change. And for many of these sectors, uh, this of course raised some questions, you know, why are we even doing this? Uh, isn't, this a, isn't this a task for politicians for us to set the tasks? But it actually created a focus uh, in, in all the different sectors as to what was actually possible. Uh, and Afterwards, after all these climate ships, partnerships presented their reports, the ground was somehow fertilized uh, that actually enabled policy to be made subsequently. Uh, because instead of talking about this is difficult, this is hard, uh, all the different sectors spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of manpower actually thinking about doing things rather than how difficult it is to do these things. Uh, so in a way, it, as I said, it, it actually fertilized the ground for the policies that were that were enabled afterwards. So, so following on from these partnerships, these were all presented just prior to Corona. Then we spent a bit of time uh, doing Corona uh, craziness. But coming out on the other side of that, uh, the government and actually in very broad coalitions has implemented quite a lot of policies. Uh, most recently, just before the summer, uh, ending up with a climate tax reform, which actually applies a separate carbon tax on top of the ETS. So both a carbon tax on the non-ETS sectors, but also a carbon tax on the ETS sectors uh, through the admission that the uh, ETS sectors aren't moving fast enough. So we're actually doing a separate carbon tax in Denmark on top of the ETS sectors. In addition, we're currently during the current election, we're actually talking about a carbon tax or uh, a, a, yeah, a carbon tax or carbon equivalent tax on the agricultural sector. And I think a lot of that, the reason why we are here, the reason why we can have these discussions actually goes back to these climate partnerships that we, that we opened up a discussion about how to do things. And that actually came from all these sectors. A lot of the recommendations by all these sectors uh, actually ended up maybe not amounting directly to new policies, uh, but it starts the, the discussion about what to do about these things. So have I used about half my time now, I think? Uh, something like that? Yeah. Uh, so that was sort of the framework and where did it up? And I think that's actually the most important lesson from this about these climate partnerships, how partnerships with the sectors, industrial sectors, but broadly sectors enabled uh, a room to take new decisions also by policymakers. Uh, it's something which started out at least and I, where I was sitting in an industrial sector or sector representing industry. Uh, we looked at it with a certain amount of skepticism, but the whole process actually opened up a lot of new opportunities. Of course, for us uh, in the energy sector, our task was slightly different uh, than it was for other industrial sectors, because to us, it wasn't just a question of what's our scope one. Um, I assume that scope one, two, three are terms that are familiar to you, but to many sectors, it, it was all, it was very much about what is our scope one, what are our emissions from our trucks for the transport sectors, the planes or industry, the coal and natural gas that we consume. But to us, and here I use us in the past tense of where I was previously, uh, was not just what is our scope one, because there's been a great transition in the Danish energy sector, transitioning from coal uh, over to primarily wind and solar, but with a strong baseload of biomass in terms of heat production. 
That was, of course, scope one, which was relevant for the energy sector. But for the energy sector, it was also very much a question of how much energy are we supposed to provide in this transition? What will be the new energy demands in 2030? And I'm jumping a bit in the text, but Denmark is a low power country, given that we have very little heavy industry. So our 35 terawatt hours of annual electricity consumption is extremely low compared to Sweden, Norway, and Finland. Uh, and that's just very much to do with, we have a, a heating sector with a very small amount of electricity and we don't have any heavy industry. So a very small, but actually as we started this work and we started looking at this, we realized that if we were to succeed, not just with reducing by 70%, but also the transition uh, beyond 70%, beyond 2030, we're looking at a very high electrification. Um, and I can say that even today, even have a, after having left a, an organization which works for electricity producers, I'm still very much uh, think that electrification is the solution. So we're actually looking at a doubling of electricity consumption in Denmark. And, and as we said that a couple of years ago, people looked at us, as if we were, well, maybe not crazy, but at least it was a fairly shocking uh, thing to say that our electricity consumption would rise as much. But those, that, that was actually the electricity consumption that we needed to have in order to realize these goals. And today, when they're talking about future Danish electricity consumption, they're not just talking about from 35 to 70 terawatt hours. They're talking from 35 to 70 to 100 terawatt hours. Uh, so a, a major transition in terms of how we consume energy and what kind of energy uh, we consume. I'll pass through this and I'll apologize my slides are in Danish, but I hope that most of you, they're fairly understandable. But I said, it's a transition of Denmark from 70 million tons in 1990. Uh, by 2019, that had been reduced to 47 uh, million tons. And then the goal was set to reduce in 10 years by the same amount Denmark had reduced in the previous 30 years. Um, sorry, yeah, 30 years. So a fairly large uh, task. And that also meant not just a completing phasing out of all fossil fuels in the energy sector, but a halving of emissions in all the other sectors. And not just industry, not just transport, but industry, transport, and agriculture, a halving of emissions in those sectors if we were to realize that goal. Now, of course, in the energy sector, that was very much about removing the last fossil fuels. And to the energy sector, that was, I wouldn't say an easy task, but that was actually a continuation of a development that had taken place over the past place over the last 10 years. Uh, decoupling of power production from coal uh, towards wind and solar. And then, of course, in Denmark, the move had very much been towards biomass. Uh, we certainly now today that I'm not working with representatives of biomass power plants, very much aware that biomass isn't always uh, the best uh, energy source, certainly if the whole world is supposed to make this transition. So today it's very much a question of transitioning also away from biomass towards, for instance, heat pumps. But for the energy sector, that was very much a continuation of a development that had been taking place uh, over the years. But for other sectors, uh, it was very much a transition into power. So for transport sector, electrification of the transport sector, electrification of the industry. And that in itself led to a pretty big rise, as I said, in the need for power. So to, to the energy sector, that was a question of, okay, how the heck are we supposed to provide that much power? So the, one of the major challenges for us in Denmark is to actually establish enough energy to service uh, these energy demands. But of course, very day, just by chance, uh, Ørsted and SIP, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners, have set up a partnership to actually establish offshore wind to the tune of, I think, 5.2 gigawatts uh, over the next six to eight years. So a fairly large. Uh, so these goals that we said look very ambitious are actually coming to fruition now. Um, I'm going to pass this. Uh, this and this is this ladder shows where at that time we expected the energy demand uh, was going to be so power to x data centers uh, heat pumps electric cars electric trains 
and electrification of the North Sea uh, oil and gas production, actually. And what has changed since then? The reason why we're not just talking about 70% uh, or 70 terawatt hours, but we're talking more than that, is, of course, the first green bulb, uh, the 10 terawatt hours from power to X. And that is, of course, a, a large joke of something which is very much in its infancy now. How much can we expect uh, from power to X? How much power demand will power to X? demand because this is very much a question of producing new fuels and not necessarily fuels for Denmark but fuels for for actually the countries around us fuels for transportation will is set a sustainable path forward is that a way we're going to go but there's a great expectation in industry certainly that that's the path we're going to go but even if power to x doesn't quite pan out as it's expected all the other sectors in education would still require a huge amount of power to deliver to them over the years. And of course, saying a huge amount of power, we're also talking serious amounts of investments uh, to a scale where the whole thing, what we're doing is, of course, we have had an energy sector. We're an energy sector that delivered the energy that we needed, but we are pushing it so that we are doing maybe 30 years of investments in a 10 year span. Uh, and we are, of course, challenged at the same time by do we actually have the manpower needed, the talent, the abilities to do these things in such a shortened uh, amount of time, something to which I certainly don't have the answers right here today. Uh, this is my full circle towards the beginning. When we stood there in 2019, we realized there were a lot of difficult decisions uh, that were to be made to realize this. But what we didn't realize is actually we already had taken the first steps towards taking these difficult decisions that just by thinking about the solutions in the sector, presenting those to the government, we were already on the path of taking these difficult solutions because framing the problem had been made and we were kind of filling out the jigsaw puzzle ourselves, which the government in effect just had to accept and implement those policies. So those are my words about uh, the Danish climate, climate, climate partnerships, what they led to, and a bit about how, where we are today. Thank you very much, yeah. Torsten. Um, please raise your questions in the chat if you have any. Um, I, I, otherwise, I, I raise a question. Uh, so, so like you say, you have Danish elections in a week, I, I think. Uh, yes. What are the main uh, divisive questions, would you say, in, in uh, the election campaign concerning related to the industrial? Uh, well, uh, the, the theme that has been biggest uh, in terms of climate and energy, actually, energy hasn't taken that much of a role, uh, but certainly climate has. And the climate aspect that is very big is the question of agriculture. Uh, because all of these decisions that we've made, uh, the carbon tax reform that we made prior to summer actually means that we expect to, I think, more than half the emissions from our industrial sectors going towards 2030. Uh, the joker in this is, of course, carbon capture and storage. Uh, it's a very big part of the solution. So the few large industrial plants that we have, uh, cement and uh, some of the refineries, are expected to go towards CCS. But yeah, the, the policy framework is in place. Uh, the laws have to be uh, enacted, but very much. But if those things actually come true, uh, we would stand in 2030 in, in a situation where 60% of our emissions in Denmark were, would come from the agricultural and the forest sector. Um, so that, of course, we haven't, of course, solved the, the issues with all the other sectors, but at least we've made a plan. We haven't started the trip yet, but we've made a plan. We've put it into the GPS. Uh, but for the agricultural sector, has not actually reduced its emissions over the last 10 years. And it will be a major part of our emissions. So a lot of the discussions in the Danish general election has been about not just the agricultural sector, but actually about do we want to implement a carbon tax on the agricultural sector? What would be the consequences? How would we implement a carbon tax? Uh, I feel that the consensus or the majority actually 
is moving towards it's something we're going to do. Quite a lot of the parties have said, yeah, we're going to have carbon tax on agricultural sector. And when I mean carbon tax is, of course, a tax on methane, uh, nitrous oxide uh, from the emissions of the agricultural sector. So that's actually something that's very big. One of the part, things that hasn't actually been as big as I thought it would is the whole energy crisis situation. We have a we have a fair share of natural gas customers in uh, in Denmark, but not as as big. Uh, it's about it's about five hundred thousand, three hundred fifty, five hundred, four hundred. Oh, sorry, three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand households with natural gas. So they, are, of course, very much uh, pay the price of their dependence on natural gas now. But it, that issue hasn't actually been as big in the general election as I expected it to be. The whole energy, poverty, inflation, those issues haven't been as big. Agriculture has actually been one of the main issues in the current election. So so uh, one short question in the chat uh, from Erin Ökstad. Uh, what is the role of the partnerships today? Uh, or was their main mission in this in the start of the uh, policy development phase? I, I'd say in reality, very much the latter. Uh, it, they, they allowed, in effect, the government to take a breather during a period in which all the creative energy, all the planning were distributed out in the, in, in the different sectors and they had all the thought processes. Then they presented their plans and in theory, they are still alive. In theory, they still work as some sort of consulting bodies, but uh, not as a formal uh, platform for developing new ideas as such. It's it's very much in that policy development phase in which they are very important. Uh, more and as I said, as I hopefully made myself clear, it's to a degree in creating new ideas, but very much in also shaping expectations. Uh, where are we going? Why are we? What are we? Where are we heading? Uh, preparing the sectors for the change that was about to happen. Thank you very much, Torsten. Pleasure. So uh, we move on to Tora Torres Dotter from Icelandic Housing and Construction Authorities. Yes. Uh, good morning. So let me share my screen here. Okay. Yes. Um, good morning, everybody, and and thank you for all the very interesting presentations so far. And happy birthday, Johan. So yes, my name is Thora, and I work at the Icelandic Housing and Construction Agency (HMS) in Iceland. It's similar to Bowerket in in Sweden and uh, Bolig and Plum Stirelsen in Denmark. Uh, so I'm the project manager of uh, the public-private program we called. We call it Bikjum Gretne Framtid or Building Greener Future in English. It formally started two years ago in September 2020. And um, I'm thankful for this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the project and uh, how we made quite comprehensive roadmap for sustainable construction industry in Iceland and, and how the implementation is, is, in, is, is going. So um, in 2019, uh, the authorities had very limited interest uh, and awareness of the environmental impact from the construction industry. But at the same time, we had uh, the Iceland Green Building Council uh, working. Uh, it was established in 2010 to encourage sustainable construction. Uh, and we had at this time very limited statistics for the construction industry, only uh, numbers of, about the emission from the construction sites and some numbers about waste generation. But slowly, slowly, more and more people and parties, uh, including the authorities, uh, realize the environmental impact of the construction industry, which is quite signif significant, even from uh, different aspects. As you can see, 30 to 40% of the worldwide emission is from the construction industry. Uh, and 49% of all the waste in Iceland is uh, from the construction industry. These are just few examples. So we can say that these st statistics uh, are, are the driving force behind the project Building Greener Future. And, and we are constantly reminding ourselves about this so we won't forget how urgent it is to, to act as soon as possible. So in 2020, uh, a formal cooperation uh, was established 
between uh, Iceland Green Building Council, uh, the Federation of Icelandic Industries and HMS with a very important backup from the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Infrastructure. And uh, the project was defined as an action uh, in the Iceland's Climate Action Plan, which, which gave it more credibility, so to say. The project was divided into three uh, parts. Firstly, to estimate the emission from the Icelandic building industry. Secondly, to set goals to reduce the emission until 2030. And finally, uh, define actions to achieve those goals. So this was our, our project uh, when we started in September 2020. And uh, the results were finally published uh, two years later in June 2022. Um, the roadmap is in, in three parts. Uh, you can see it on, on this um, uh, uh, web page, bgf.is. Unfortunately, the roadmap is, in, is all in Icelandic, but uh, hopefully we can translate it, some of it in English soon. But it is in, in three parts. Firstly, that we have those um, have information about the mission. The second part is uh, with the goals and, and you know really the action plan. And third part is the short summary of the whole project. Um, and here uh, is the total number of the emission and our goal of 43% reduction before 2030. And uh, here we can see better how the emission is divided into uh, different lifetime phases of uh, buildings. Uh, I'm not getting into those numbers. The point is that we defined the emission from Icelandic construction through the whole life cycle of, of Icelandic buildings. Um, as from the production of the uh, building material, even though it was it is done abroad, and until the building was demolished, um, instead of having only numbers about the mission from the construction site, we had now the whole picture. And knowing this, we uh, were able to define actions uh, systematically uh, to systematically reduce the emission uh, from the building sector and also to reduce waste and, and improve energy use of buildings and so on. And here are the actions in total 74. And here are the most of the parties who have committed to, um, to be responsible for, for the actions. In total, we are more than 30. Uh, but having said that, we know that we uh, will not be able to get our goals only with those 74 actions. We need the whole value chain with us uh, we need all parties on the market to step in as well, as many parties as possible. So we have also defined some ideas of actions for, for them, which they can uh, look up in our roadmap. So um, this action plan, as I said, was published in June 2022. Uh, at that time, about 30% of the actions had already were already in process, which made the roadmap and the action plan more dynamic and more exciting for all the stakeholders to participate. This was something that was going on and on going, going to happen and already happening. I also want to mention, to my surprise, um, we have seen at least two or three examples where private parties have seen opportunities to make some business out of some of those actions, which is really beautiful, I think. So in some way, the action plan has worked as a platform for innovation. And here is the timeline of the project, just to make it clear for you. We have already, yes, defined the mission goals and actions and, and involved the stakeholders. We have published the roadmap and now we have started the implementation phase. And we we plan before end of 2024, we will uh, revise the emission goals and action according to new data and our experience. And then we will continue until 2030. So just to, for you to get the whole picture. But anyway, um, now the question is how we, we, we got uh, from this, the situation I was describing in, in 2019 um, to this a comprehensive action plan with, uh, dedication of more than 30 participants and stakeholders. Um, first, I would like to mention that we managed to activate uh, relevant, uh, relevant ministries and the relevant institute as well, which gave the relevant authority to the project. We also managed to involve Green Building Council in Iceland, giving the project a power or, or like power uh, of knowledge. 
And we also managed to get the Federation of Icelandic Industries on board, as I said, with the element of influence and networking to the market. So as probably know, these elements, authority, power, influence is very essential uh, for, for successful progress in all projects. So I think we managed to, to uh, form this in an effective way. This is really the core of the project. These parties developed um, great communications, a lot of trust, and just common enthusiasm. Very good cooperation and important. Based on that, we formed this uh, process management team in September 2020 and added some more uh, key parties into the group, for example, the municipalities. Um, and the team decided very soon that we need to form the project in a convincing way and bring our best specialists uh, to the table from the whole value chain. So we got our national team in sustainable construction on board. We got some budget to pay for their work as well. And one group was, um, estim was estimating the emission from the industry and five groups were defining some actions to, to reduce it. And uh, uh, the leaders were from the, from the market, good experts, and as I said, uh, participants from the whole value chain. Um, when the, uh, we had also five workshops uh, where the groups put their ideas of actions uh, on the table and got valuable input from uh, all, uh, all other stakeholders who were interested to, to, to uh, uh, participate. And finally, the groups handed in uh, their ideas of actions in May 2021 to the project management team. But um, it was one year later that we issued the action plan, uh, as I've shown you. Uh, yes, I said it was a whole year past as from the ideas of actions came from the groups until we published the roadmap, really. But um, that year was used in some way to start the implementation of some of the actions. Um, and that, um, but mostly uh, we used the time also to find the parties on these slides, those who were suitable, able and willing to, re to be responsible for the actions. That took some time and, and we didn't want to uh, publish the action plan without uh, knowing who would take care of each and every action. And, and this, I think, also reflects the bottom-up process of this program. We got very good reactions from all of the parties. Uh, we only got one no, and I think that was just a misunderstanding. Uh, it was very strange, but, but very, very positive reactions for the whole time. Um, and then uh, we published the roadmap. Uh, we, we put it in uh, public consultations for, for two months. Uh, we got very positive and helpful comments, uh, which we'll, uh, we will use in the implementation phase and, and when the roadmap will be revised in, in two years. So we had all kinds of uh, uh, consultations with the stakeholders through the whole process, uh, which is very important to, to secure their ownership. And I think you all uh, relate to that. Today, we have formed a new project management team for the implementation phase. Um, and we welcome all parties who are interested to participate. Before I, I stop, I, I, I would like to stress out some examples of factors for, for um, good progress so far. Um, uh, in the beginning, I, I, uh, I can say that, uh, yes, I, the institute where I'm coming from, HMS, uh, put this um, uh, mission in 2019 to uh, reduce emission from the construction industry without even knowing the impact and without even knowing how to uh, reduce it. Uh, so there were, uh, it was a lot of courage, I think, to, to just state that. Um, uh, uh, and the HMS has also been involved and participated in many um, projects like this in, in other fields. Um, and uh, we, they, we stress uh, cooperation is a very big factor in our operation and all the staff is encouraged to, uh, uh, to show initiative in, and so on. Um, and also as a project manager, I, I got a very um, good uh, support and trust from the managers. Uh, and also, it, also I, I can't uh, state enough, uh, our participation in, in Nordic programs, um, we really got uh, um, uh, very in, in, in important information and motivation from our Nordic colleagues. So um, Nordic programs, which HMS is participating was very important as well. 
I also want to stress out uh, Green Building Council. Luckily, they had been operating for 10 years before the program started, so they had a lot of knowledge and, and network. And also the Federation of Icelandic Industries, they really had a strong will to act, and that was uh, very uh, important. Without it, you know, nothing would have happened, I guess, or it would have been a much uh, difficult task. And then uh, the ministries really uh, stepped in with uh, uh, the really were able to put the project interests instead of political interests when we were working on a project and they gave us permission to, 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 to develop the project according to the needs of the building industry. Uh, and they really uh, gave us trust and support, you know, through the whole time. Very important. Uh, the work, uh, the project management team was very ambitious. We had great knowledge on board and experience. And if you look at the value chain and the stakeholders who participated and, and got involved, uh, we, we sensed enthusiasm and really a need to, to work on this. And, and I think everybody said, finally, finally, we are, we are working on this. And I also have to mention COVID because I think uh, that uh, made us we had to work this prog program through the through, through teams meetings, which I think in the end made it more efficient. But uh, just um, yeah, and and I think the most important thing, the top priority for everybody who got involved was the project interests, you know, and and that was without exemption, very important. Finally, some just final recommendations who who are interested. Uh, if you are starting a program like that, uh, I recommend that you look for good examples, learn from other programs, other industries, or even countries, and uh, adapt to your, uh, to your project. You can't just copy paste, you really have to adapt it. And just find some ideas that you like and use it to uh, adapt to your project. Take some time to form the project. It's, it, it is a learning uh, period, uh, important learning period, and it's uh, a great opportunity to network and, and get broader ownership of the project. Um, participants are very important uh, and try to focus on bottom-up process with, uh, with uh, support from the top, of course. Uh, try to get diverse parties from the whole value chain. And uh, I recommend that it's, important, it's good to select some key participants who, who uh, promote the project with the project managers and the project management team. Um, because we participate in a lot of events and uh, we have a lot of presentations everywhere to promote the project as much as possible. And it's great to use the opportunity to share information, even give the audience some you know, scoop or, or just uh, some news about what's going to happen in the nearest future. And, and praise participants who are doing great job. Use the opportunity to praise participants who are going doing great job that is so inspiring and motivation motivating for everybody and finally here are some you know key words or key elements who brought us a long way i think even in difficult moments uh, elements in project management team you know trust keyword cooperation enthusiasm optimism passion dynamic dissemination of information promotion active listening Gratitude and problem solving. I think that's, you know, some uh, good elements to have when when working on a program program like that. So that's it for now. Uh, thank you for uh, for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, I don't know if we have the time for that, Johan, but I can also answer on the uh, chat. Thank you very much, Tua. Yeah, we have uh, uh, one question in the chat from Ilva Tengblad. Are measures for recycling, sustainable handling of glass? fiber composites wastes included in the strategy if so in what ways um yes uh, so in general we we um, we had uh, goals for um uh, reducing uh, landfilling and also to reduce waste on on per built square meter but um uh, that's glass is one part of it but we don't we don't have significant really special numbers for that so yeah it's included in in the bigger numbers thanks so so uh, just keep uh, raising questions in the chat to all mm -hmm. of the speakers i think and i think uh, the the second uh, session also relates to the building uh, industry somehow since we will discuss steel and cement and uh, measures to to uh, uh, provide markets for green products and I guess uh, the building sector is important there. 
so yeah, we'll hopefully tie it together in a bit. Thank you very much, Tora. Thank uh, you. So we move on to Karin Tormal from the Swedish Forestry Industry. Yes, and I can see that we are quite run out of uh, all the time here, but I'll try to yeah. share the screen and uh, make this uh, make this presentation. Now let me yeah. see. Um, now let me see. Yes, I'll make so. Thank you for inviting me, and it has been very very in well. Uh, you can see my my presentation. Yes. Oh, good. It's, you always have to start with that question. Thank you for inviting me, and it has been very interesting to listen to all the others, other colleagues in in uh, in the different different countries. I can realize that that a lot of work is going on, and and. Uh, I have been asked to talk about the Swedish forest industry roadmap for fossil free competitiveness uh, and uh, uh, well I skip that one just just to to give you background uh, of course we have a lot of different different uh, national goals regarding uh, 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 reducing emissions uh, of course in Sweden as well but I I didn't put this up at the moment because I focused on my our own roadmap and and um, uh, the, the background here is that we ha there's kind of a, it's a government uh, initiative that is called Fossil Free Sweden, and uh, it's an it's initiative to when the the government decided that Sweden should be the first fossil free welfare nation in the world. I can see that you catch up quite quite good in the other Nordic countries as well. So we'll see if that will be the case. But however, one part of this, this uh, work is this fossil free Sweden that is a, it's a, it's a, a small, um, well, it's an, it's an, a special office that, that work with this issue. And there, they have been uh, promoting different sectors to present their own roadmaps. And they started in 2018 where the first roadmaps uh, presented. And for the moment, there are 22 different sectors that has presented their roadmaps to become fossil free, uh, but still keep a high, way, high um, level of competitiveness. And the forest sector is one of them. So we presented our uh, roadmap in in 2018, and just a few words about the about the process to develop this roadmap. And and we have had first of all internal working groups within our our organization and uh, reference groups, including our member organizations. The Swedish Forest Industry Federation is a is a is an organization with members within the forest industry uh, companies both pulp and paper and, and sawmills. I should have maybe started to, to present that. Uh, we had a lot of hearings and workshops, including many different stakeholders from NGOs and environment uh, in, in, and uh, in agencies and people from, from government as well. So just to discuss how what, what's important for the forest industry to become fossil free. And we also had a broad discussion with with other uh, other sectors that also were on their way to 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 create and to to develop their roadmaps for the for the same purpose. And finally, there was a board decision on on uh, in in our board, so to say. And. Uh, the content of the roadmap is that I'll go through this very broadly later on, but it's a vision and we have goals and we have targets about how what what we what we will 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 do, so to say, and our what we will carry out. And we also find out that we made a description about what we feel that we need from policy politics to be able to implement the roadmap. I mean, there are some some parts that uh, we don't really, uh, it's not our in our own hands to, to on what to do. And what we realize is that when we compare the forest sector to other sectors, that it's that um, our challenges are in another, in a way different because for the, the processes in, in our industry, they are already fossil free. The sawmills are 100% fossil free, uh, 
and there's some, I mean, there are a slight two, three, four percent of fossil fuels used in, in uh, pulp industry uh, for the moment, but that's not, that's not a sectorial issue it's more of different companies carrying out different things so that was a very small part of our roadmap compared to 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 um, uh, steel industry and to to mining for example where and all, mo most of the other sectors having quite big share of their processes being uh, used using fossil energy uh, of course. So that was what we we realized that that's that's uh, we check for for that part more or less. So we we were discussing about how do forest sector contribute to climate change mitigation, and we we com we can see that that's done in three different um, I mean overall uh, overriding ways. First of all, we have the capture, carbon capture both in the forests and in the biobased products. I mean, that's, that's a, an important part. And the second part is that the substitution, so to say, where we have biobased products, we replace fossil-based products or products that have a cause major fossil emissions during production. So that's also a, a contribution to climate change mitigation. And of course, the, the last part is not reducing the, the fossil energy that we use in, in, uh, in our own, own uh, sector, so to say. And one part there is, of course, transport. That there we have the same issue as all other uh, sectors. So we need to, to work very hard on that. Uh, and the, I, just uh, the, the picture here with a, with a truck with timber, that's uh, actually the first electric heavy truck. Uh, so that's a very, very interesting uh, uh, development. So what we find out that our, the vision in our roadmap for fossil free competitiveness is that the forest sector drives growth in the global bioeconomy. So, so we should use more of renewable sources than, than, uh, uh, than fossil ones. Meaning that the, this entire, so to say, the, whole, the, 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 the transformation of the whole society that where forest sector can contribute to, to fossil free uh, society. Uh, and the goal that we put on is a, it's not very, it's not very specific one, but the, the we we want to contribute more and more for a fossil free uh, society. So we want that to that part to increase. And then when you come to the different targets, we we have put those in two diff different um, well two parts, so to say. First of all, it's the growth in the bioeconomy, and there we we in that includes that we want our 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 share of the swedish gdp doubles and uh, we want the the market for wood uh, wood products in the building for example should should also increase and uh, we need an investment in research and uh, and innovation of course um, both from we, we we have put a lot of um, resources there by ourselves and we want the the society to to um, uh, to also to do that, and we want the forest sectors deliveries to for, for bioenergy to to increase, and uh, and biofuels. Um, I mean, production of biofuels should also be uh, increased. Should also be increased, and the second part of the our targets is it's about the phasing out the fossil energy in our own sector. For, so even though. The process is only is only 96 is to 96 percent fossil free. It's we still have some fossil energy, uh, so we should of course, that's of course a, a target to phase out that. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, we should reduce the the emissions in in uh, transportation as well, of course. Uh, and then when we come to the what is what's needed for this implementation and we can see that what is what should be um, what's needed is that there is a, a political ambition for a bio-based uh, society so i mean that should be um, 
as should be pointed out actually. And uh, well, competitive conditions for the sector in general is, is of course to be able to, 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 to grow. Uh, and another quite important part that is the short access to biomass from sustainable managed forests, where we have a, a huge uh, discussion uh, within the EU, not at least. And there should also be an increased focus on freight transport. And then this was written in 2018. So there has actually uh, happened a lot of things. There was a quite developing in this uh, in this area about transportation, uh, both regarding focus on freight transportation, transportation, not only a person's uh, um, uh, transportation. So, and and uh, improving efficiency in transportation, being able, for example, to load to have bigger and longer trucks, so you don't have to to have uh, um, so much, um, well, you, that makes it more efficient, let's say, that e for each run that you do with the track, you, you load more. And of course, using railway in a, in a, bigger, uh, in a bigger share. And, and uh, as always, continued investments in research and, and innovation. Um, Yes, so uh, that's more or less the 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 roadmap as such, and there is uh, annually this uh, the initiative Fossil Free Sweden. They may they make uh, yearly an, an update or an, an uh, a follow up of all the twenty two roadmaps and have a so so you you present more or less what things that you are doing to 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 meet the targets in your uh, your roadmap but as well we have decided uh, to to make an, an upgrading of the roadmap so we'll do that we have just started and we'll do that during 2023 and these are four areas where we will focus now and it is this with technical carbon sinks, what, what could be done there, so to say. Uh, uh, and we should, of course, the continuously increased production of fossil free and renewable products. Uh, and the transportation uh, em related uh, fossil emissions should also increase and uh, um, substitution for society through a competitive forest sector. All those three later, the three um, last parts, they are, uh, uh, they continue to be, they follow from, from, from the, the previous roadmap or, or the, the, the one that is we have for the moment. So we'll continue with those three parts, but the technical carbon sinks is more of a new new part, so to say. So, uh, well, thank you. I think I'll stop there for, for the moment. And um... thank you very much, Karin. Uh, we have a question <laughs> in the chat um, from Jukka oh. Rasenen. How do you see the EU forestry strategy from biomass, sustainability, and access perspective? Well, the, the EU forest uh, uh, strategy, I think it's that's no problem actually <laughs> there are bigger problems with with other other regulations uh, in the for the the um, both for example the uh, um, restoration uh, and uh, the red 3 and uh, uh, lulu cf and all those different climate and environment uh, focused um, I can stop sharing this actually. Uh, parts are, are uh, much more difficult. The forest strategy is, is quite, in, in, uh, compared with others, others it's, it's uh, ha possible to handle. But it's very, it's very, very clear that the uh, European Commission do not like uh, bioenergy from forest residues, even though it's not, I mean, even if it's residues and, and, and uh, rest, 
uh, streams from industry. It's uh, it's very um, tr it's a little bit tricky. Thanks, Colin. So I think we all need a, a break. Maybe we can um, keep it to seven minutes <laughs> instead of 10. But yeah, uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, OK, one more question. But maybe you can take it in the chat. I can take it in the chat. But unfortunately, yeah. I, I actually, I, I have to leave oh. now. So so but I'll, I'll answer this question as good as I can. And uh, okay. I hope, I suppose, that we share uh, contact information later on. So if anybody has any question, please come back later as I can't uh, join the rest of the seminar, unfortunately. All right. Th thank uh, you for yeah. joining us this morning. And uh, thank you all, to all of the speakers. Very uh, encouraging, I think, to hear all things going on in the Nordics. Still a long way to go, but 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 uh, definitely encouraged, encouraging. So we'll take uh, around seven, eight minutes break. So we reconvene at uh, quarter to 11. 10.45, so we can uh, grab a cup of coffee and uh, shake our legs. So thank you, and uh, we'll reconvene at 10.45. All right. Are you there, Jukka? Yes, indeed, Johan. Hey. <laughs> so, yeah, let's start them. So, uh, moving into the second part of the webinar, I'm talking about uh, marketing, market creating measures for green products. Uh, three speakers in this session. First off, Jukka Vesenen from Neste Oil in Finland. Uh, then we move on to Ola Hansen from H2 Green Steel in Sweden. And uh, finally, Per Bre Brevik from Norsen in, in Norway. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I'll uh, stop sharing and, and leave the digital floor to you, Jukka. Yeah, very good. Uh, thank you, Johan. Um, yeah, my name is Jukka Rasanen, and I'm uh, heading business and strategy development here at Neste for uh, Partvex. And uh, I'm a chemical engineer, graduated from uh, Chalmers, Sweden, and uh, I've been now uh, a bit over five years at Neste. Before that, I was about seven years in petrochemicals. Okay, so um, today I will I will uh, present our approach for Power to X uh, from the uh, let's say uh, from the market perspective. Um, is this now in the front? I guess it is. What about yep. now? Uh, from uh, from uh, from a bit uh, from the market perspective, then uh, also uh, about what we have in practice ongoing here at Neste, and uh, then uh, I will summarize or try to summarize that. Okay, what kind of actions are are required uh, for Partrix? Great! Uh, what a beautiful scenery. I think it is, uh, and and I think this is all common for us here in the Nordics that we have a beautiful landscape that we want to maintain. And that's an important driver for, uh, for the uh, for power to access uh, as well uh, to maintain uh, the nature uh, in a, in a good shape for the next generation of children. And and uh, Neste here, uh, we are a liquid fuels company by by tradition. We create uh, renewable. Fuels. So we are all also an oil refining company, and uh, we support our customers to reduce their GHG footprint by refining different kinds of feedstocks, uh, different kind of raw materials into fuels and sustainable feedstock for for plastics and other materials. And we operate uh, globally. Uh, we are a world's leading producer of renewable diesel and sustainable aviation fuel. And we are developing, for example, chemical recycling then, uh, then as a solution then for, for plastic challenge. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, why we are doing this is, is because we believe that this is the right way. Uh, our role uh, in the value chain is clear. And we've been able to demonstrate the commercial success uh, through the renewables as well. Um, we last year we made about 1.3 billion euro profit, of which uh, above 90 percent uh, was through renewable uh, products. 
So it is clear that uh, for us that this is the right way uh, from the, let's say, from the sensible human perspective, but also from the commercial perspective. So sustainability is a driver for our strategy. And what that means for us is that we take lead in transforming value chains, for example, in the plastics, uh, towards towards renewables. That's the first step that we've done. We work with brand owners to prove that, hey, uh, we can provide feedstock for this value chain and demonstrate through digital tools, for example, that the value chain is there so that the physical connections work. And in your products, we can have then ultimately the sustainable feedstocks. So this is one example of how we're transforming value chains towards carbon neutrality with brand owners in plastics. But then again, we set ourselves also aspirational targets. I'll discuss that uh, a bit more. Uh, for example, for CO2 reduction and biodiversity in feedstock sourcing. Uh, the, we don't, uh, we don't um, for example, we, we have feedstock suppliers and, and within these contexts, we have always the negotiated conditions and these are always open for, for renegotiation. Meaning that we want to ensure that our feedstock suppliers are not only complying with the stringent requirements that we have, uh, but that also they are ready to transform together with us towards the ever, let's say, complexifying uh, requirements, uh, considering also human rights and, and, and different uh, factors in the feedstock supply chain. So sustainability is an important factor for us uh, in feedstock sourcing and our approach for feedstock uh, development is that uh, we are developing a platform of different feedstocks. Um, for some reason, the, the bar here is a bit on the top. Uh, I hope you're still able to, maybe I'll move it here. Um, so we're developing these uh, new feedstocks um, and uh, we're developing those uh, through our innovation business platforms. That's what I want to say here. And uh, then these, business platforms are expected to create future growth and why do we have these business platforms is that we need this i'm sorry for the bar here but we need this portfolio approach because the timeline for these solutions is long uh, and not single feedstock is enough to decarbonize the entire industry uh, we believe that for example the current waste and residues that we use now at neste are are limited uh, uh, to some degree. We talk about tens of millions of tons of potential, but that's not nowhere enough. Um, we need hundreds of millions of tons for the coming decades. And these are achievable through, for example, novel vegetable oils, municipal solid waste, lignocellulosic, cellulosic energy crops, algae, and then ultimately power tracks. But none of these alone is enough. And here at Nesta, we are developing this portfolio because these feedstocks are required and because they have also different time frames. In power to x we are in the very early phases. We don't talk about millions of tons of feedstock potential this decade. One million ton of e-fuels would require two of the world's largest nuclear reactors running continuously to provide the energy. We have here in Finland today, uh, we are ramping up the world's largest reactor and it's not simple and it took a very long time to build it. Of course, in renewable space, the renewable energy uh, portfolio looks also very different. So there is also the intermittency challenges that need to be overcome before we have nuclear reactors, amounts of continuous electricity through wind and solar. So the power to X uh, is not technically developed uh, or uh, limited. It's renewable energy limited and before it can come to millions of tons. At Neste, we are now doing small scale piloting. We aim to have something uh, meaningful for the market in the middle of this decade and scale up big 2030 and beyond. And the way that, uh, the way that we look at it is that uh, this portfolio is not, uh, not only uh, important for, uh, for, you know, for, the, for the society, in practice, it's also very necessary for for the market development. For example, in the sustainable aviation fuels, which is a segment that is particularly difficult to decarbonize by direct electrification, especially for the long haul flights, 
uh, we want to support the aviation players and uh, uh, today, we have solutions that are based on used cooking oils, animal fats, fish fats, to produce then renewable jet fuel. And this can cut emissions up to 80%, uh, but uh, we see that in the future we need new raw materials. That's why we are developing this, for example, lignocellulosics and municipal solid waste, which are not feedstock limited. The technologies are implementable into large scale in the near future and therefore can also help the further aviation customers to decarbonize. And then the third part of the portfolio is the power to x for example, which will take more time. Of course, we will have some tens or maybe hundreds of kilotons uh, during this decade. But before we have what we have next year, 1.5 million tons, it will still take time. So from us, it's an important uh, factor of having this portfolio approach to have also a promise to the market that, hey, today we can help you solve your, your challenges of today. And we are working on the solutions for tomorrow. In the uh, sustainable aviation space, we need regulation, incentives, and we are seeing a growing voluntary market also. And this goes for, for all of the sectors. It's not specific for aviation fields, uh, but the, the examples here are. So for example, in, uh, in the um, sustainable aviation space for Europe, we are seeing mandates. Uh, we're also seeing these different opt-in incentives, which then um, um, kind of bring an opportunity for the fuel suppliers and production uh, producer incentives um, to, to then uh, help solve these challenges. And then we have these EU ETS and Corsia based uh, targets, for example, which then oblige uh, airlines and, and uh, provide also voluntary schemes for them to follow. And then ultimately we have end customers that can accelerate SAF demand. I think one of the great uh, examples of this is, uh, for example, Coldplay, you know, the rock band, uh, and uh, uh, through our uh, sustainable aviation fuel, they were able to uh, decarbonize uh, their, uh, their world tour. And, and this is kind of a great example of how by choices of individuals can also make an impact in, in, the, in this space. Okay, then uh, coming to the practical terms uh, in, in PTX, we are now focusing on the Nordics, but for global growth, we look at the world map, of course. In uh, power to x uh, we seek uh, for collaboration. Neste, we are a fuel company. We are, today, we serve uh, Asian customers, uh, uh, European customers, and American customers, uh, starting with next year joint venture, as a home market. We have production in Singapore to serve the uh, uh, Asian markets. We have also uh, production here in uh, Finland at Rotterdam to serve European markets. And we're starting a joint venture in the US uh, from which we will be able to also provide to um, North American markets as a home market. So that's this part of the value chain is particularly strong for us. We're a refining company. We have our own engineering competences. Uh, every fourth person at Neste works in either research and development or engineering. So we develop a lot of technologies, we develop them from, for ourselves, and we are efficient in using uh, new novel technologies, uh, starting them up and optimizing them. But then we need partners for uh, optimizing the upstream. For example, in renewable electricity space, Power2X provides excellent options for energy players to um, extend their offering just similarly like uh, power to x liquid fuels helps us to extend our offering for the customer so there's great synergies for collaboration along the value chain and this is what we're um, developing today okay very um practically sorry for the um com continuous uh, uh, moving of this bar i don't know uh, don't know how to put it away. So in a very practical terms, 
um, here in Finland, uh, we uh, have an oil refinery, uh, which produces, of course, uh, significant CO2 emissions, about 3 million tons a year, give or take. And uh, every third uh, ton of CO2 comes from hydrogen production. So for us, as uh, we are committed to carbon neutral production by 2035, going green in hydrogen is an important part of this. But uh, we aim to reduce our CO2 emissions uh, through our own um, or from our own uh, operations by 50% by end of this decade. And, uh, and uh, to achieve this, we need multiple different uh, steps. We need uh, renewable electricity sourcing for our refinery. This is uh, already pretty uh, far taken to be. And we need energy efficiency improvements. And we need, uh, as, as mentioned, we need hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen production. And uh, this is uh, something that uh, maybe uh, I'll uh, stop for a, uh, for a brief while. And uh, so we have green hydrogen projects now ongoing uh, in Porvo. This is uh, for us uh, a very important um, platform, not only for uh, decarbonizing of our own operation, but it creates an opportunity for new value creation, and not only for Neste, but for uh, our value chain partners through, for example, sector integration. And when we, what is kind of uniquely characteristic for Nordics is that we need a heat source. Um, there was also a mentioning about um, how forest management is to be done in the future. But I think it's the same uh, like we have here in Finland that in, in Northern Sweden, you will still continue and, and Norway uh, to heat up the houses and then the electrolyzer heat will provide an additional energy source then the biomass that is today used for combined heat and power can be released for something else. Uh, either that's biomaterials, byproducts, chemicals, fuels, whatever. But there is already a hydrocarbon that can then be converted to something maybe more valuable to the society. Okay, uh, the shark project here um, used to also include a carbon capture but we have switched out uh, from the CO2 uh, capture project and we have increased our ambition for green hydrogen. And that's also visible now here in, in the figures. Our uh, first phase of green hydrogen is about 120 megawatts. And uh, we uh, are uh, then uh, aiming to scale that up uh, to 360 megawatts by the end of the decade to ultimately then have uh, emission reduction of, of 4 million tons during 10 years of project. Okay, I uh, uh, promised to summarize or, or end with a summary of, of what needs to what needs to happen uh, for for all of this to to then uh, become business. How do we? What is required? And and uh, I think uh, many of these are not new to you. Uh, we need massive investments to renewable power production. Um, as mentioned, uh, one million ton uh, requires uh, two of the world's largest nuclear reactors worth of energy continuously. So the amount of energy is big, but it's not impossible. It is possible and we have great benefits in uh, Nordics. Uh, we have infrastructure which is not in terrible shape. It's in good shape, but it needs further strengthening. And I'm happy to hear from many of the presentations before that we have also national ambitions to, to speed up these uh, permitting processes that both speed up this infrastructure and renewable electricity investments. That's very much needed. Uh, something that we see uh, a geopolitical question also, I think, is uh, electrolyzer manufacturing capacity. Uh, there's no short um, term oversupply of electrolyzers. There is uh, very much of demand of electrolyzers. But these are, at the end of the day, these are machines. It's like uh, automotive seg uh, segment in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, when, um, when we need cars, we will need to manufacture them. Or like mobile phones, uh, how Nokia built it up uh, for, uh, for the 90, end of 90s. Uh, manufacturing capacity can be ramped up, but we need to accelerate this. Um, I think there is also an opportunity for Nordics, not very much in the previous presentations, I think. Um, yeah. 
okay, uh, ultimately we need uh, partnerships. This is an opportunity for value creation along the value chain. We need regulation and we need funding. And I can't emphasize the regulation enough. Um, of course, uh, in uh, north of Sweden and, and uh, Norway, uh, there's a high degree of renewables in the electricity grid. So based on what we've seen in the delegated acts so far, it seems that these locations would be, uh, let's say, uh, ready for uh, RF and BO production. But here in Finland, we still do not have regulatory clarity on how to buy the electricity for a renewable uh, hydrogen production. And uh, if I just remind you that with this 120 megawatt electrolyzer, that's a big scale, we will become one of the biggest electricity procurers or buyers in Finland. So we really desperately want to see the regulatory bodies now sit together and come out with a clear proposal how this is to be performed. It's completely different to US and uh, where we see a much clearer regulatory driver for clean hydrogen production. It's an incentive based and it's much more clearer. And I'm very fearful that if European uh, regulatory bodies do not come with a good proposal, that we might not be able to ramp the industry up in the uh, same speed uh, as intended or as required. And, uh, and uh, also uh, there is a competition for electrolyzers uh, globally also. So uh, kind of there's a sense of urgency, uh, but we need a clear and enabling regulation uh, to then ultimately justify the investment decisions. Okay, I'm, maybe uh, in the end, uh, a more positive note that, hey, we want to proceed faster, bolder, and together. Uh, at Neste, Part2x opens uh, new opportunities that we can offer to our customers, and for uh, it also opens uh, strong possibilities for um, good collaboration, uh, beneficial partnerships along the value chain. Thank you. Um. Thank you very much, Yuka. Uh... Two questions in the chat. Uh, yeah. One from Inge Stalmokaite. Uh, I think you touched on it perhaps, but uh, what is your company's view on carbon capture and storage ut utilization technology? You see it as being part of your company's decarbonization strategy, especially for the refineries. If yes, no, why? Yeah. Okay, Inge, uh, uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the question. It is. Uh, very much part of the part of the portfolio. Um, uh, it is there still uh, as a planned uh, planned step. But um, if I uh, just give a brief uh, brief uh, argumentation why uh, it's not a part of our hydrogen uh, pathway at this moment uh, anymore, is that um, uh, there was a very um, let's say uh, we are doing steam methane reforming and, and as the natural gas uh, conditions changed there was a horrific war started uh, started by Russia therefore also the questions related to uh, what kind of feedstocks do we want to uh, fix ourselves to for the long term uh, became into question and uh, therefore uh, switching out from natural gas uh, based uh, hydrogen was an important uh, element for us um, to take. And that's why we've speeded up uh, green hydrogen. Uh, carbon capture and utilization, uh, also including storage, are, are part, uh, part of the pathway. Uh, but uh, right now, what we're looking at uh, for, um, for our uh, current refinery uh, is that uh, we aim uh, to, or we have this strategic study to uh, end uh, fossil crude refining by 2035. So in this pathway, uh, then uh, our emissions would be uh, 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 reduced, of course, also significantly. So um, it is part of that pathway, but uh, there are also huge questions to solve in how do we ensure that we have future-proof feedstock for the refinery. Um, that's a, that's an important part of the question. Thanks. And a, and a second question, and then I yeah. think we have to move on, but uh, from Ali Hedayati, what about the energy you need for the process to convert municipal waste to SAF? Yeah. Are you going to electrify the whole process? If not, what is the source of energy? 
Oh, very good question, Ali. Uh, renewable electricity is, is required, renewable energy is required. And uh, this, this comes um, uh, in particular into discussion with MSW, also including uh, green hydrogen plays an important role. Uh, but this um, GHG um, reduction question is, is very much uh, studied by the team uh, so, and, and it's an uh, important factor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jukka. So, um, so with that, I think we move on to Ola Hansen from H2 Green Steel. Thank you. Hello. Nice meeting you all. Uh, so I'm trying to share my screen as well here. Um, let's see if it works. Um, hopefully you can see it. Yes. Can you see it? Yep, we see it. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, try to uh, keep the time limit here. Um, I'm from a company, a rather new company called H2 Green Steel. We were founded a little bit more than one, one and a half year ago. Um, and we're a purpose-driven industrial startup. And our purpose is to decarbonize hard to abate industries mainly by using renewable hydrogen as, as a source. Uh, but we start with steel in that way, creating our own demand for the re renewable hydrogen. Uh, our first project is to build a, a steel plant, a green steel plant in uh, the north of Sweden, in Boden. Um, it will be a, a plant with um, initially a production of uh, two and a half million tons of flat products and ramping up to the double uh, before the end of the decade. And uh, five million tons, just to get a figure on, it's about, it's a more than 5% of the European uh, flat state production. So it's a little bit, yeah, you could say that it's about 100 million tons produced in EU annually. And we will also, of course, here use electrolyzers. And we heard earlier here, Yuka present the next ambition of a 360 uh, megawatt plant, which would be really huge. And this is an even bigger plant that we aim to have prepared already in 2025, an 800 megawatt electrolyzer producing the green hydrogen. And why is steel so important to decarbonize? It's about seven to 9% of global emissions. It's 5% of European emissions, but 25% of the industry emissions in EU and also a big part of the Swedish emissions. And just to compare on the EU level, it's uh, the steel industry globally has more emissions than the EU emissions of steel in EU is more than the total Nordic emissions and, and more than the flights and also almost half about half the emissions of all cars. So it's, it's a significant uh, part. Of course, we talk now about decarbonization uh, a lot, but, um, oh yeah, okay. But, um, and where, where do we prepare to uh, sell these products? What are, who are, which are our customers? And it's, it's a lot in automotive, but also on white goods and, and construction um, uh, are the potential products. And we talk a lot about the decarbonization, but of course we have other aspects that we also want to have the aim to be really become leading in. And it's a circular economy and it's digitalization and also uh, social dimension of sustainability. So we're quite, uh, we aim of, for example, having 50% of our employees also at the plant level being uh, women. Um, and I think this is po possible because we're building the first greenfield steel plant in Europe for that has, it's, it's the first plant built since 50 years. The last one was built in the 70s. So of course there's with new technology and digitalization, there's a lot of, uh, ability to take away uh, many of the very heavy uh, manual part, uh, heavy work duties uh, in the factory. Uh, just to give you some chemical background, what's happening. And I think what, what, what we see is that when you 
uh, replace uh, the current iron ore based production, which is which is the blast. You add coke, which is uh, pure carbon uh, based on coal, to the blast furnace to reduce the iron ore into iron. Uh, then you that's where you get the main part uh, of the emissions of the current uh, production route, the main route used in the EU. And it, it's, you get about two tons of um, carbon dioxide per ton of steel. With the new route where you produce hydrogen from re renewable energy and you mix this, mix this hydrogen with the ore in the direct reduction uh, chamber, you reduce the iron ore and instead of carbon dioxide, uh, uh, you get water and the iron coming out of that part. You then melt it in an electric arc furnace, also fueled by renewable electricity. And this process on a scope one and two basis has only has below uh, 0 0.2 tons. So it's, it's more than 90%, almost 95% reduction that you can achieve going this route. And just here, another example where we do, we, 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 we use our three platform is the hydrogen production unit, the iron making part and the steel making part. And we will also use as much scrap as possible in our production, uh, we, in, in our circular aims. But today on EU level and global le level, scrap is a, a supply constraint uh, resource. There's not enough scrap to meet future, future demands uh, even for decades. So we will need primary steel. That means steel coming from iron ore. So that's why this, we can't meet uh, future demand only with scrap. So we need these new uh, hydrogen based uh, production uh, and, and, and ore based steel as well. And we will have a mix in our products of, of scrap and, and iron ore based steel. Coming to the demand side, I think that was sort of the, the uh, main theme of this, this session is that um, in order to get the finance here, we, we just launched, launched the news yesterday that we have approvals for all loans we need. Uh, now it's only the last steps in the equity process, then we will have be able to reach financial close for, for our plant. Uh, a requirement for the from the banks, which was a really good one, <laughs> a similar one that also applied to Northvolt, the battery um, producer that have the same founders as we have. Um, they also had a requirement to, to pre-sell their products. And we have sold more than half of the annual production volume for the first five to seven years to a large uh, different variety of, of buyers, both in the automotive industry, in the white goods, building material, and also uh, steel suppliers to the rest of the industry. Um, and I think a basic driver here is voluntary uh, carbon climate targets. Uh, many of these, or the majority of these, have set so called science based targets where you in addition to looking at your own scope one and scope two emissions, the emissions you have in your own production and with the energy you use, you also need to go upstream or downstream, so-called scope three emissions. You need to look on the whole value chain, where are the emissions? And for example, for automotive, once you've gone electric, then you don't have the downstream scope three emissions, then you need to look, the production isn't that much, so you need to look upstreams. And if in addition to batteries, the embedded carbon there, steel is the next uh, largest uh, carbon carbon contributor to the embedded carbon. So it's about 20% in an in, in a, uh, electric vehicle. So of course, this isn't one thing that they are, the, the companies that are looking for to decarbonize and meet their climate targets much, much uh, must look at. So I think this has been a driver for us and we have also, managed to negotiate a green premium in all these contracts. So uh, all these customers uh, buy, buy our steel for a, a, the steel price plus a green premium on top of the brown steel price. 
and just this is a figure just showing that the science-based targets is, has been growing uh, also in Europe but also globally so there's this is a big trend driving our the uh, demand for our products uh, I think looking at EU tools that could sort of help uh, to speed up this process I think in addition to what Jukka mentioned here I think we we need a cost on carbon. I think the faster we can have a real cost on carbon in the EU emissions trading scheme, we now have free allocation to the steel sector. The faster we can ramp, phase this out, the faster the transition will go and the the, the better level playing field you will have by, by the, the new green production and the old brown production. I think level playing field in this way also uh, it comes to finance that we need to support, but we also need to support in a, in a fair way. And now you see that a lot of countries <laughs> with the Green Deal as, as sort of a, a, a shadow are really putting their industry on steroids. I think we need to save the internal market really in, in the EU as well. Um, another part that is, I think, also very important now that this new regulation in preparation is the eco design directed that is going to be revised and a lot of more things are going to put into that and there you could have the same kind of development as you have now in the battery regulation on the eu level that there's a demand to report on carbon and environmental footprints and there can also be thresholds you need to meet or broadings like you now have for for energy, for example, when you buy a refrigerator, you see different classes. You could have the same development here, also on the steel uh, steel side, going forward. And that's something we would uh, standards that really are ambitious and don't um, don't uh, make it possible to do very creative accounting, as we see several examples of in several sectors, uh, even in the uh, biofuel sector. I think this uh, is something that we need really strict rules on. So ambitious uh, and stringent uh, standards will help to push the most, uh, the most uh, decarbonized and environmental friendly products going forward. Thank you. Let's see. Thank you very much, Ola. Uh, we have a question in the chat from Ilva Tengblad. The new Swedish government has recently launched their energy agenda. Do you find that you get what you need from it to deliver on your plans, business case? <laughs> uh, we, I, I think you, if you read the news, we have not, we're not, we think it's really good. Uh, we have the, I think in our case, in the Northern Sweden, we, we see that we, there has been a great progress in planning, both when it comes to uh, supply of electricity, but also getting the, the connections and transmission lines uh, to our plant. So in that way, I think uh, we're fine, but we would, of course, want to see uh, a more balanced uh, electricity market in the whole country. And I think we're positive to the ambition to generate more, uh, have more production in South, but we, we see that there is a very, that the, the sort of, the battle between different production types is still on there. And that's something we're totally against. Uh, we, we want to see uh, that you build everything you can build. And I think going as, fa as soon as possible, and then you need a lot of wind and energy also uh, that can be built uh, long before you have the first new, new nuclear reactors uh, in place. And I can also say, I think we, we see that uh, we are our second project I didn't mention is on, on the Iberian Peninsula, that we have planned to have production one year later than in, in Boden. And there we see a, a very fast deployment and possibilities for renewable electricity, and we, we, which is really positive and will push down the cost of electricity. As, as you, can, you can mention, that's uh, the the availability and cost of renewable electricity, which is the whole, uh, I think it's a key key aspect of making uh, renewable additional hydrogen production possible. The plant there will be uh, largely supported by, by, by uh, sort of behind the meter built uh, solar power. Uh, 
question from Björk Haldors daughter. Where has this new production method been tested or will this be the first at scale production of this sort? Uh, it, we're going full scale. We're not building a pilot plant. Uh, we are, of course, uh, say harvesting on what uh, our sister product in Sweden, Hybrid, has developed and, and pushed sort of the technology for hydrogen based uh, steel making forward. So, so this would be say, taking that, what they have done, and, and building a much full scale, larger uh, steel plant. And, Compared to that project, we will also build an integrated plan. They, they will have the separate separate uh, green iron production with the steel plant. So they will cool down the product. We will have an integrated plant where actually hot iron will go to the steel facility. And that by we can save some additional CO2 uh, emissions by, by not uh, needing to heat up uh, our products in a way, getting it more energy efficient. A follow-up question related to that from Björn, Björk. Uh, and is, is the CO2 savings a theoretical one or proven? It's proven. I think that's, I mean, that's the whole hybrid project is about proven that you can produce the same steel or even better steel with better uh, properties with uh, so much lo uh, less, uh, more than 90, up to 95% uh, less carbon emissions. Thank you very much, Ola. I think we will move on. I have a question, but I will raise it in the in the chat. Um, so thanks, Ola, and uh, we'll move on to Per Brevik uh, from Nusam. Um, then we have to see. Can you see my screen? It in here you have it in bright mode i think yeah i think we see your presentation mode for some reason but maybe that's okay um, is it okay yeah it works okay yeah uh, thank you for the invitation and it's good to be among friends uh, here in the hard to abate industries it's really interesting to hear both Juka and, and uh, Ola in this discussion. It's very good. And we're representing Heidelberg Materials now and Brevik from the Norsen plant in, in, uh, here in, in uh, Norway. But uh, as you know, concrete is essential for building a sustainable society. You find it everywhere. And uh, you need it to build this society in infrastructure, especially, but all over you will find concrete that the problem for the concrete industry is the production of cement if you talk about when you're talking about uh, co2 since uh, the cement is the glue in the concrete and the cement industry we count for six to eight percent of the total co2 emissions in the world every year so and that was when we started this project in long time ago as i will show uh, that was one of the reasons why we were interested because this is so important we have a responsibility to work in this way. And therefore, we have started and it started as an R&D project, but we have continued and we will realize the first carbon capture plant in a cement plant now. This is the background that you haven't found another way and without emitting a lot of CO2 uh, in industrial scale. You can do very much in the laboratory, but you can't do anything in industrial scale. You haven't found out any way to produce the cement. And two thirds of the emissions from, from the cement production coming from the calcination process, the chemical process where the carbon, uh, calcium carbonate is split into carbonate, uh, calcium oxide and CO2. And that is done by heating up the meal from the, uh, the, uh, the limestone. And then it's split into calcium oxide, which we need in the cement production and CO2. And for each ton of product we produce here, we emit half a ton of CO2. So this is important for us to do, but that's two thirds of it. And that's unavoidable. 
the other, the last third coming from the fuels, we can do much with, and we have done very much in the cement industry. And for instance, in Brevik, 80% of the fuel is now alternative fuels where we are substituting the coal, which was the normal, the traditional way of producing cement. And the industry, we, we have taken responsibility. We want to do this and we have worked for this for quite a long time. And as I mentioned, alternative fuels is a way we have worked with for a long time. We can use alternative raw materials, other th things, for instance, um, Alcine clay can be used, for instance, for some uh, to substitute some of the limestone, etc. But to take the step, to take the real cut of the of the cake, then you have to go through carbon capture. At least that was what we thought, and we started already in 2005, 2006. We started with disk studies, which we discussed if this is possible. A lot of people thought we were quite crazy, I'm sure, but. From 2011, we have taken step by step, developed the project. Uh, and uh, and uh, after, and especially I will mention the, the here in the middle of, of, of the screen, you have the test project, which we did in 2013 to 2017. We used a hundred million uh, Norwegian kroner, 10 million euros, and that, as I said at that time, I don't know if we, if this will be a success, but nobody can tell us that we will not, we are not trying to find out this. We had funding for this, of course, but we, it was a considerable amount of money from our own pocket. And this test project is still the basis for what we are doing actually now. From 2015, we were part of the government's capture development carbon capture development project. And that was the basis to, for them to make their decision to launch Longship, the first full scale chain from capture through, through, uh, through the uh, working with it and to clean it and et cetera, et cetera. Then we went for, for transport and storage. And, this longship project, which was launched then in late 2020, the, the project today is you have the Norsen Breivik plant, cement, you have Hofslund also the Celsius is part of it. That was earlier owned by Finnish group Fortum. And both of us will build plants. We will capture approximately 400,000 tons per year. And this will be transported by Northern Lights. Northern Lights, which is a a cooperation between Equinor, the Norwegian oil company, Shell from the Netherlands and Total Energy for, from France. And they are responsible for transport, intermediate storage on the Western coast of, Nor of Norway and for the pipeline and storage, permanent storage in the North Sea. This is how it is organized. And that I think that is most the most, most important thing. It's interesting for us to, to do this project the capture project, yes, but I think the most important part of this project is the infrastructure. You establish an infrastructure because I'm sure there will come new projects all the time, but they need a place where they can deliver it. Then to so to to establish an infrastructure that may be the most important takeaway from the project. The other way, so sorry. Uh, I mentioned that that we started as a demonstration project, and that's also the reason why we are only only in in brackets um, capturing fifty percent of the CO two because we are using the excess heat from the cement production and from the conditioning tower uh, from the capture plant, and that we 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 calculated and estimated how much energy do we have, and then we calculated backwards how much can we capture. And that's the reason why we are on 50% capture rate. If this is a success, and I hope it will, then we know how to increase it up to more, no, more normal rate, uh, capture rate of 85 to 90%. But that's, that's the future. The most important thing for us now is to build it, to, to 
integrated into the cement production and to see functioning well for a, in full scale. We are sure we managed that, but you never know before you have really tested it. But the key element and the key challenge for this project, in addition to the cost and the schedule, etc., is to simultaneously build a plant, new cement plant. You see it on this 3D picture. Everything with, with color is what we are going to build in this, in this project. We are going to build it while we are operating at full speed. We managed in 2021. I think we will manage to, when we can, when we uh, look at the, uh, the figures for 2022 and hopefully also 2023, we've managed to do this in parallel. But it's challenging. And uh, as you see from the, this picture, it's uh, not very much space down there to build. If you are in the 3D world, then you see that you don't need to to you, you can take away the, the old plant, etc. But you see, it's a quite complex structure which will be built, and we are still approximately on schedule that we will have them mechanical complete in February 2024, and the first ship load should go beginning of July 2024. So it's a huge challenge, but we are on track and we think we are doing quite well. And it looks promising, promising that we will manage to be the first capture plant in the cement industry. And then we have some pictures from how it looked when we just when we started and where we are going. We are now in the building phase. We have demolished half the plant, half of the plant, all the workshops, the canteen, uh, etc. And then we are rebuilding it. A new, here. If you look at this one, maybe we can have the animation here. You can see what we are going to erect alongside the cement plant. It's very so you start with the waste heat recoveries, you have the compressor building, you have the stack, etc., and a lot of pipelines which has to be built. And everything, as you see, especially when you see the maintenance at the center coming up now there is very little space down there. So hopefully we will manage to do it in the same pace as we have done, but uh, it's challenging. But the plant is, I, I can, can't talk enough well about the plant and the, the people working there. I think they have done a really good job up till now, and I'm sure they will do. Last week, you see here, it's a steel plate coming from Lithuania. 100 tons was transported by by a lector up to to a barge up to to to, to, to Brevik and it was taken by the crane etc and it's ready here it's ready for lifting in place to be be the founding for the waste heat recovery units so it's hard work and it's narrow and a lot of people working at the same time there's been a lot of public interest connected to the, pro the project. We have worked for a long time now, and we have a lot of stakeholders and uh, people following us closely, both from the government, from the EU, EEA, of course, internally in Heidelberg Cement, academia, neighbors, etc. They are really interested in how is this working and how is will, will we have huge changes when you are finished? We have a responsibility for the taxpayers' money, and we have an open door. We're taking a lot of visits, and I think last year we had more than 70 visits uh, from outside, and now we are still on the building. So it's interesting when we come into full production. One important point for, for the ministry and the way here, since we have a lot of public funding, is what we are doing for the benefit realization that we con contribute to deploy CCS in other industries, or especially in the cement industry, but also in other process industries, that's important. And uh, so, so we have learned a lot uh, from that. Also a huge focus on the cost control and sharing the experiences we have with others. And we have been quite open, we will be quite open, and that's part of what we are doing together with the authorities. And as you see, a lot of prominent people have been there. 
but I say prime minister, former prime minister, the former former prime minister, uh, now general uh, secretary, secretary general for NATO and the crown prince. They have been there and they are interested. They are re really interested and especially the crown prince in crown prince. In, he impressed with all his good questions and his involvement and engagement. So what can we do in the future? And as we talked about the, the benefit realization that that we should contribute to, to further deployment. Uh, the key question from the prime minister has always been, will Brevik be the first and last project or will it be the first in a row? And it was good to say today that we can see that we will contribute. Brevik will be first in a row. And especially if you look at this project ongoing now, Brevik is the most mature, yes. Uh, Lehigh Hansen in Canada, really interesting and they will, approximately one and a half years behind us. We have high net in Northwest in, in, in UK, where we have a cement plant as, as one of the uh, CO2 sources and a very interesting project and important for us in Scandinavia is the Cementa project on, on Gotten at Sleeta. If you manage to do that, that's four times the size of the Brevik project. So with the other project, they are not that much uh, that matured but huge interest and you're working with uh, a lot of companies that come to us and both internally and others coming to us. And we want to, of course, we want to share our experiences. So we have started and you have to start now if you are going to change things in the future for our process industry. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Per. Uh, so we have a question from Ilva Tengbard in the chat. Cement co-processing will be an important next step for more sustainable handling of wind energy wind energy blades. Do you have any experiences of lowering uh, lowering your CO2 footprint by mixing used glass fiber composites into into the cement? We used the the the, the electricity, call it green electricity, etc. We we use that in Norway because most of the electricity in Norway is from water power. So yeah. if I understood, so, but of course, some of some parts of it and discussions, especially if you go to other pl plants, I think wind power, et cetera, could be interesting to, to cooperate. Yeah, I think the question here was also if, if you could use, use uh, recy recycled blades. Uh, oh, uh, yes. As a mi mi to mix in into concrete or, or? Or they mix it in composite as, as an alternative fuel. Some composites, can be used, but uh, some of them are, are more difficult to, to be used. But uh, but uh, we, we have tried and glass fiber, etc. We have used it, but there are some challenges. But uh, our experience is that it's possible to do things, but some quite often we have to use more, uh, or we will have a lot of cost to, to prepare it to be a fuel because you have to you have to uh, through through. Um, Cut, you have to cut it and then have it uh, the size, the particle size is so important when you're discussing alternative fuels. But it's possible, definitely. Yeah. So thank you very much, Per. I think yeah, we're a bit tight in time. So I, th I think we'll have to move on to the next step, which is the group discussions. Um, so you will be... Uh, divided into groups and we have to shorten that those discussion also to to be able to to finish in time but uh, so we'll uh, have uh, around 15 minutes for the group discussions i think um there are uh, three three questions to discuss uh i guess yeah each of you can pick maybe maybe one of the questions to pick up on uh, what are the your key takeaways from the uh, webinar and presentations today? How can the Nordic countries work together to s facilitate the transition? And a third question, from the perspective of your industry organization, what are the key, key priorities for realizing uh, the industry climate transition? So, so I, I will share those questions in the chat as well, and, and we'll break up in, in uh, separate rooms and reconvene in uh, in 15 minutes so five minutes to 12 or something like that 11.